Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello and welcome to episode 66 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises on a dingy police interrogation room. A man is sitting at a table, blindfolded. Two policemen enter, take off the blindfold and begin to question the man, who says he has no idea why he's been brought to the station. The man is a writer, and he wonders if there is something in the stories that he has written that the authorities have objected to. This is a possibility because these officers are representatives of an unspecified totalitarian state. But the police are not interested in the man's stories because of their political intent. They are investigating a series of gruesome child murders that appear to follow the plots of several of his stories. This is the chilling opening of Martin McDonough's disturbing black comedy, The Pillow Man. The play follows the policeman's increasingly brutal interrogation of the writer and his younger brother who is being held in the cell next door as they seek to discover the connection between his macabre stories and the terrible real life crimes. Martin McDonough is perhaps more famous now for his films, including In Bruges, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, and The Banshees of Inishirin. But he began his creative life as a playwright, with works such as The Beauty Queen of Linan, The Lieutenant of Inishmore, and more recently Hangmen, and A Very, Very, Very Dark Matter. It could be said that all of McDonough's plays are very, very dark matters, as they are bold black comedies that often feature descriptions of or actual graphic violence. The Pillow Man was first presented at the National Theatre in London in 2003, with Jim Broadbent, David Tennant, Nigel Lindsay, and Adam Godley in the cast, winning an Olivier Award for Best New Play in 2004. As we record this episode, the play is enjoying a popular revival in London's West End, directed by Matthew Dunster, who directed McDonough's last two plays, and with Lily Allen taking the part of the writer, Katurian, originally played by David Tennant, and Steve Pemberton as the policeman Topolsky. I think it is true to say that McDonough's work provokes contrasting responses, and his mixing of humor with the horrific stories enacted in The Pillow Man is no exception. I'm very glad, therefore, to have an expert with me today who can help guide us through the shifting terrain of McDonough's creative world. He is Eamon Jordan, who is Professor in Drama Studies at the School of English, Drama and Film at University College Dublin. Eamon has written two books on the work of Martin McDonough, From Leland to L.A., The Theatre and Cinema of Martin McDonough, and Justice and the Plays and Films of Martin McDonough, as well as edited essay collections on contemporary Irish literature. Welcome, Eamon. Thank you very much for joining me from Dublin. Thank you, Douglas. I suggested that McDonough's work divides opinion. There are many people who love it. The Pillar Man has been regularly performed all over the world, and the current run in London is selling very well, despite, or perhaps because, it is not an easy watch, a point we may discuss, while others really don't like or get what he's doing at all. This includes some critics and academics, I believe, who have been hostile to his work. One critic wrote that The Pillow Man was mere entertainment, written by a playwright with a disturbingly defective moral sense. What do you think his critics take exception to, Eamon? And conversely, why do you think his plays like The Pillow Man are so popular? Uh, that's a complex answer to that. When the plays appeared originally, the audiences seemed to like it in the main. The reviews were very positive. Theatre companies jumped at the opportunity to stage the work internationally. And yet you had in the background lots of debate. You had audiences that felt a real visceral response to the work in terms of liking it or disliking it. And then you had a lot of academics coming out and saying very negative things about the work. And the negative response could be summarized in the following way. People complained about the stereotypes. People felt that the writing was full of talent, but heartless. People felt like it was work that was copying work that appeared earlier, like Singh or Tom Murphy with Bollygon Gora, for instance. People also felt 
that the world that Macdonald represented was represented inaccurately. In other words, he was accused of misrepresentation. On the other hand, theatre director Gary Hines, who directed the first production of Beauty Queen, uh, said as follows, you don't go to Martin McDonough's work for authenticity. It's a world of artifice. And I think that's a real good way of making sense of McDonough. You can't accuse it of misrepresentation when it doesn't set out to represent, first of all. And secondly, it is artificial. And I think that artificiality it shapes then people's responses to the dark humor, to the excesses of the work, and to, I suppose, the kind of characters that he creates. And key to that, to my mind, would be two things. One is the absence of impulse control, the characters can say the unsayable in some respects. And secondly, it's very difficult to know whether characters are protagonists or antagonists, victims or perpetrators. And that type of blurring runs across all of the plays, including the Pillman. That's fascinating. Boy, there's a lot in that. Great answer. I guess some objected to the portrayal of Ireland, as you mentioned, Irish stereotypes. But if the argument is that it isn't meant to be authentic, then I guess you can evade that criticism in some way. I suppose the other question is, is he endorsing violence in some way, the way he depicts cruelty and violence with an almost flippant humor? It's clearly offended some people. And this is something that would be a very interesting to explore as we talk, is whether all of this is slightly gratuitous. And beyond the shock value, the work doesn't have any so-called real artistic merit or depth. But this is something I think between us, maybe we will explore, if not disprove. Can I ask you to help us place where The Pillow Man comes in the context of McDonough's early career as a playwright? When did he write it and how does it fit into the sequence of his other work? Yes, again, a complex answer, because in a way it appeared in 2003 after the success of the Lenan trilogy, which was The Beauty Queen of Lenan, A Skull and Connemara and The Lonesome West, and after the success of The Cripple of Anish Man at the National Theatre in 1997, and then after Lieutenant of Anish Moore in 2001. However, the play entered a playwriting competition in 1995 in its original form. It got a play reading at the Finborough Theatre in 1995 as well in London. And in 1997, at the Court Festival in Galway, there was also another play reading of the play. So it was in existence for quite some time. And it emerged originally from a whole series of short stories that McDonough wrote back in the day before he became successful as a playwright. But as John Crowley, who directed the first production, said, in its original form, it was called A Wilderness of Stories. And then as it was rewritten, it took a greater type of coherence and focus. But the kind of darker aspects, it seems, existed throughout all of those stories. Uh, so there are two things I want to ask you about from that. As we'll come to, the play does consist of a number of different stories. Had he written some of these before in their own right then? It seems. Again, the issue with McDonough is there is no archive, so nothing can be proved or disproved. You're basing your response to newspaper interviews, comments by directors, you know, interpretations by academics, but there's no hard and fast archive that you can actually visit and say this existed at that date. So as a consequence, then, you don't know for certain. And MacDonough himself is an unreliable witness when it comes to <laughs> the sequence of his own work. Part of it is playful. Part of it is just to be a bit kind of subversive. Yes. So I gather. The other point was that this is, as I understand it, is the first of his plays not set in Ireland. And actually, I read somewhere that he wrote the very first draft of his first seven plays in a nine-month period in 1994 altogether. Yes. And so if any of that's true, then some people have suggested that his not setting the play in Ireland was a response to the critics who criticized him for the portrait of Ireland he presented in his other plays. But if he wrote it before all that came out, then of course, that's not the case. But it is important that it's his first play not set in Ireland, isn't it? Absolutely. And of course, you know, initially you asked the question that where is it set? It's set in an unspecified totalitarian state. People assume to be Central Europe or Eastern Europe. The timeline is not indicated. Some people would suggest it's set in the 1950s. Others would suggest it's unnecessary to give it a date and time. And many scholars have identified 
the, how the names of the characters resonate across Central and Eastern Europe, whether it's Poland, Czech Republic, Albania, and likewise, the, the place in which the play is set is also resonant of many different place names across, again, the Czech Republic, Central Europe, and Eastern Europe. So it's unclear. But on the other hand, and this is something that I, I've written about recently, you can also read it indirectly as a comment on the interrogation of many Irish people in Britain during the 1970s. So you can read it from a diasporic reading as well, and not to think about it in that Central Eastern European way, first of all. And secondly, I think more importantly, when you look at the details of the play, it is really about police power, police corruption, and the power of the state. And while it is a totalitarian state, you could also look at it that the democracy is a subtext to all of that. Yeah, it's interesting. While you were talking, I was thinking I never even thought about or worried about what the timeline might be, because in a way, I just think it's timeless and that it could be anywhere. And it represents a location where, as you say, the power of the police or the state is strong. I'd like to just roll back a second, Eamon. And for listeners who are unfamiliar with the play that we're talking about, I usually like to give a very brief summary of the plot. Would you be able to give us a short synopsis of what happens in the play? Okay. Well, it's also going to echo what you already said earlier. So you have a writer called Katurian, 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 (laughs) three Ks and do what you want with that. And he's been interrogated by Ariel and Topolsky. And it's about a series of gruesome child murders. And as you said earlier, uh, the stories that Katurian have written seem to serve as a template for how these murders were enacted. And in a way, you're looking at then the idea of the writer writing work that may or may not influence a murder. And in this instance, it's children that are killed following the stories and details. And as he's interrogated, of course, the piece becomes darker and darker because we learn a bit more about the family background of Katurian and his brother. And his brother has been effectively tortured as a child in order to prompt the creativity of Katurian. And again, there's a great perversity in all of that. And his brother, Michael, has suffered some damage. I mean, he's described in various ways as being mentally disabled in some form partly because of his abuse as a child. I wanted to ask you actually one of the stories, and we'll talk about the form in a minute about all these stories, but if you could just give us the bare details of what the story of the Pillow Man is from which the play gets its title. Yes, the Pillow Man itself provides the overarching kind of narrative of the piece. And it's about a figure that is formed out of pillows. And it's very, very interesting. Two things on that. One, there is a sequence of paintings by renowned Spanish artist Paula Rego on the Pillow Man, and there are fascinating renditions of her view of the Pillow Man. And in the first production of the play, they tried to put the Pillow Man on stage during their previews, and had somebody who resembled Mr. Blobby, and then they decided to remove the Pillow Man, because he just needed to be in her imagination. But the Pillow Man was somebody who visited children to warn them about impending trauma going to enter their lives. And at that, before the trauma started, the pillow man gave the child a choice, take their own life now and die a horrific death, or to suffer throughout their lives and then to die horrifically alone. So the pillow man offered a form of comfort during suicide. It's a kind of very dark story. But McDonough takes that darkness and transforms it into something else by the end of the play, which we'll get to at, at a later point. Yes. Fascinating. You can't get a more graphic example of the contradictory tone, I think, of McDonough's vision than the figure of this pillow man who is nine feet tall and made out of pillows, as you said, and who you imagine from the name will be a comforting companion, but whose role, as you describe, is so horrific. He offers children as young as five the option of suicide in order to avoid the suffering and misery of life to come. And you can't get much more nihilistic than that either. So there's some suggestion there, listeners, about the kind of tone of the stories that we're going to encounter in this play. 
I'd like to come back to the setting you talked about, because as you say, it's not really set anywhere real, I think. And whatever speculation I think is relatively pointless. It's almost a metaphorical setting in a way, isn't it? How would you describe the effect of this unreal place which we inhabit throughout the play? Well, I mean, first I would start by saying what are the the real settings we normally anticipate around interrogations? So if you watch programs where there's a police officer or a team of police officers investigating a crime, you have an interrogation room, you have a camera, you have a recording, you have witnesses observing, you have a lawyer in situ accompanying the person being interrogated. Procedures are followed very carefully. Rights are read out. All of the protections we associate with the criminal justice system are substantiated through those programs. Here, it is the complete opposite. You have no rights as a detainee, effectively. You're threatened, you're violated, you're punched, you're intimidated, you're executed effectively, or potentially you could be executed in this space. There's no right to a trial. There's no right to face a jury of your peers. There's no proof beyond reasonable doubt. There are no extenuating circumstances. So effectively, the unreality is the opposite of what we assume that happens in democracies. And yet we know from interrogations in the 1960s and 70s across the world that that isn't the case. We know from Abu Ghraib when this play was produced in New York in 2005, what was going on there. And we know from around the world, the lack of human rights when it comes to interrogation. So that's the essence of it, really. So it's unreal in terms of its location and its specificity, but it's very real in terms of our understanding of justice and criminal process. Yeah, that's very interesting you mentioned that because it it is the worst of one imagines a totalitarian kind of scenario, isn't it? And the abuses that are possible there. And of course, that's very real. And it reminded me, particularly the beginning, when Katurin is uncertain about why he's in the room and they haven't really given him any information, of course, of Kafka's The Trial. Yes. But also I wondered about the tone as well, though, always contradicts this sense of whatever reality we're trying to understand. There's almost a parody or pastiche of genres going on, isn't there? And of course, that's reflected in the tones, the comic and the literary within the extreme violence and the way that they behave, these policemen, which is both threatening and very funny at the same time. So he's disrupting our expectations about what the genre will be, what would normally happen in one of these interrogations or in a a story of serial killings, all of which contributes, I guess, to this sense of unpredictability, unease, even unreality about what could happen. Anything could happen. As you say, these policemen are not accountable in any way. They don't appear to be accountable to any system of justice, as you just described. Can we talk about the structure of the play then, too? Because central to which is the fact that much of the play consists of stories being read to us or narrated and silently enacted. So this is not a conventional naturalistic theatrical drama being acted out. Why do you think he chose to present all of these different storytelling sessions, so to speak? What's the effect of these readings and enactments? So stories are fundamental to McDonough, really. And it's really about what stories do and what stories offer. And in the first instance, you know, the stories we tell to ourselves about ourselves are important. And the story Katurian tells to himself about himself is that he is a writer and he is a writer of merit and of standing. He also tells the story of the writer, not so much as dissident, which is part of the trope of the writer in a totalitarian state writing against the state. Here is a writer willing to remove anything that is subversive or political, which in a sense, Pagan is having fun with that. The other thing is that we absorb stories that we hear in our community and our environment. And some of those stories are enabling, some of them are disabling, some of them are motivating, some of them are demotivating. And in the instance of Michael, he takes the stories And he does the stories as he describes it. So he doesn't understand the difference between fact and fiction. And that's the function of story in that instance. But more importantly, McDonough relies on the fairy tale format in order to to do something, I think, very provocative around blurring distinctions between protagonist and antagonist, as I said earlier. 
but also to distort our expectations around story. Because in a sense, our fairy tales, as we have consumed them, are all about journey, encounter with the ogre, the victory over the odds, and in a sense, you know, uh, the happy ever after ending. And McDonough takes all of those and subverts each and one of those very successfully with the fairy tale stories that he creates within the play. Yeah, those fairy tale stories, as you say, they're all very dark. They're fables that don't necessarily have the expected moral conclusion. And also what I just thought in simple terms is that it's a testament in a way to the power of storytelling, because go back to the structure of the play, the fact that these stories are read to us at times or silently enacted while Katurian narrates them, for example, it's surprisingly gripping and interesting just to be an audience sitting and listening, as one would when we were children, being read or told bedtime stories. Yeah. And of course, many of these stories are fairy tales or twists on fairy tales like Grimm's fairy tales. I have to say again, however dark and difficult the imagery and events in these stories are, one has to admire McDonough for his imagination in creating this amazing range of extremely vivid tales. And in fact, actually, well, I was going to mention that in the current London production, I found that the enacted stories are almost the most mesmerizing bits of the show. Mm. They're theatrically incredibly inventive. They're like little plays within the play and almost remind you a bit of, I don't know, puppet theater or something. And it connects us to a world of childlike imagination, doesn't it? Yeah. Which, again, there's something metaphoric about the setting and mm. the fact that we're inside some kind of imagined place and story, aren't we? Yeah, I think that's a very good and important point because it is like a puppet reenactment. The important thing that these stories are not realistically reenacted. As you said, they're done silently. They're done without, I suppose, cause and effect. So when there is pain caused, there's no consequence to it. So you see it seer realistically, you understand the gore associated with it, but it's cartoon-like in orientation. And the best way of explaining that is that the French theatre style of Theatre de Grand Guignol is a good example of theatre of sensation and excess, or a kind of carnivalesque understanding of the world where everything is dark and surreal without being grounded in reality. So I wouldn't like to see a play in any shape or form where children undergo any form of pain or torture. And yet there are children on stage undergoing a form of pain and torture, whether it's narrated or reenacted, but it's not done realistically. And it's the absence of that authenticity or that kind of verisimilitude that's so important when it comes to this piece of theatre. We'll have to get into that, I think, a little bit about that unreality and how we respond to the graphic images and the violence but still on the idea it's about storytelling and how this is so much about storytelling, isn't it? Where they come from, what the nature of story should be, the author's intent. As you said, he actually gainsays the idea that there is a specific political intent. In fact, Katurian says that the first or only duty of the storyteller is to tell a story, not to deliberately load them with political or social meaning. He says, if you've got a political axe to grind, go write an essay. I say, keep your left wing this, your right wing that, and tell me a story. I mean, he's saying all that to placate his accusers, of course. But I don't know. Is this something you think Madonna believes as well? Or like everything in this play almost, it's too simple to take that at face value, but that he's got some stance about what writing should be. Yeah. Later on, I will talk about you know what I think Madonna's stance might be in terms of writing. But I think, first of all, whatever Katurian says about writing, he's not to be believed. Okay. <laughs> That's the first thing. And uh, the second thing is that Katurian says, if you want to write a story, you know, he hates the idea of anybody writing about his own life. Imagine, make it up. And yet, one of his most convincing stories is the writer and the writer's brother, which is really, really close to his own reality. So in a sense, contradiction is essential to all of McDonough's characters. So that brings about a degree of flippancy, a degree of irony to what's said. But also, as Tom Kilroy says, irony is not just about different points of view, but it's about possibility. And I think McDonough's approach to irony is about opening up possibility, different types of reading, different types of interpretation, not jumping onto one point of view or perspective, I suppose. I think that's the crucial thing here. Yes, one understands the principle, but then it becomes very unsettling because it's very hard to understand who or what to believe at any one time, of course. Yeah. 
There is nothing definite going on from any of these characters in anything they say, and they all actually admit that as well, just about. It was interesting you talked about the sourcing. I mean, because I guess that's partly also a question one might raise about the act of writing, of course, or creativity. Is where it comes from? Is it autobiographic? As you said, we see example that there is a link between Katurian's experience as a child being exposed to the sounds of his brother's torture, which is the story you just described, that it becomes the source or inspiration for his own creative stories. Again, what is McDonough's take on this? Because if you take that to its logical conclusion, where are the dark stories McDonough's coming up with coming from? Yeah. All of these fairy tales that he creates, are they coming from his subconscious or some previous trauma? I doubt it, really. Yeah, I, I don't know. But I suppose part of the irony is that his brother is John Michael McDonough. And there's, you could obviously see uh, the writer and the writer's brother as well being played out there, ironically, uh, in many ways. So there's always the other layer. And of course, you know, you can get caught up in the layers and the layers and the layers. But at the same time, there's nothing definitive in terms of what people say. But there is something definitive in terms of what they do, I suppose. And I think that's the interesting thing when it comes to McDonough's work. But it's also interesting about his questioning, I think, how we respond to story while we're searching for meaning. Are we asking the writer to tell us what he intends, that there is some sort of specific meaning he's attempting to communicate or convey? And of course, as we just said, he may disown the idea in terms of a political intent. But any kind of interpretation, it leaves it open to. And perhaps that's what he's saying about his own work, that the whole idea is that I'm going to leave this completely open to your own interpretation. And there is, of course, no one definitive truth. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, he also explores, I guess, the question of the effect of childhood trauma in any form, not just for the writer, because all four of the characters refer to having violent parents. Uh, in the case of the policeman, for example, it comes out that Ariel was sexually abused by his father and in fact killed him. And Topolsky's father was a violent alcoholic. And, and Topolsky makes that explicit connection saying Ariel had a problem childhood and he tends to take it out on all those who come into custody. So what is he saying about this familiar proposition that violence begets violence, do you think? Is that too glib? Y yes and no. But I mean, I think Topolsky says effectively, I had a problem childhood, you know, and I'm a violent alcoholic like my father was, but I still take ownership of it, I suppose, is the thing, even though he is perpetuating that. Yes, and he does say, I'm just tired of everyone around here using their shitty childhoods to justify their own shitty behavior. Yeah. And of course, that ties in with the vulnerable child aspect to all of the work more broadly as well, which is another point. But in terms of fairy tales, I think it's really important that he minds those fairy tales. Bruno Bettelheim has a great book on fairy tales, but he talks about fairy tales serving the idea of polarity, that, you know, everybody has the contradiction within themselves, the good and the evil. But the fairy tales create polarity for you. And it's easier to decide, he says, you know, punishment and fear don't really get true to people. But what gets true to somebody is what side you take. And he suggests kids pick the side of the hero because of the likelihood of success. So the idea that we identify more with success and the likelihood of succeeding, that that's the more important aspect of the fairy tales. So in McDonough's fairy tales, then you have you know, the young girl who takes her revenge on the cruel father. So we take her aside in the kind of Cinderella type of way, but she is then attacked by somebody else because of her violation of somebody else unknowingly. So the cycle is perpetuated rather than actually closing. So there's no happy ending to that. Yes, the polarities are blurred in the play in lots of ways, as you suggested earlier, and made me think of the policemen, Topolsky and Ariel, for example, as characters. So, yes, they are brutal, but they also, Ariel particularly, ironically, has this idea that in some way he's protecting children and society in his role as policeman, even if he uses excessive force to do so. Because he is paying forward in some way the abuse he suffered as a child. So again, it's not black and white in a fairy tale sort of sense, this character. And likewise, Topolsky as well, there are moments where you see a softening of his character. Yeah. And understand he does have some understanding and empathy for others. So again, it's not the black and white polarity of fairy tales. 
Still with the subject of writing, Eamon, of course, the central conceit of the play, or one of them, is that Michael has been inspired to commit the crimes by the specifics of Katurian stories. And you talked about this earlier. So does the play overtly raise the question of the responsibility of the writer for the impact of what they write? And that raises the question of censorship, perhaps. Should they be censored or self-censored? Certainly, the policemen here suggest that Katurian stories, for example, should be destroyed. What do you think McDonough's take on this is? I assume he's against censorship. He's against censorship, full stop. I know he, uh, he has said in the last while that he's had queries about you know companies producing his work and asking to change lines and to censor some aspects of the plays, and he's refused in every instance so far. So that's one aspect of it. I think he's against censorship because he can differentiate between art and life in a certain kind of way. And just because he would say his characters express racist, sizes, misogynistic comments, it doesn't mean they reflect his. So all the time he's saying, you know, the writer has an obligation in a way to serve the characters, serve the story. But I don't think he feels obliged to be self-censoring in that way. Yes, I am absolutely certain, as you've just verified, I think, that McDonough would be referencing his own freedom to write whatever he wants to write, including these graphic stories and their dark imagery and acts of violence. It's a challenge to any critic who questions that aspect of his work in some way, I would have thought. Which brings us, I guess, to the violence in the work. And you talked about separating art and life, but the graphic images and particularly the uneasy mix of humor and horror, I call it uneasy, but McDonough said, I walk the line between comedy and cruelty because I think one illuminates the other. And yeah, I tend to push things as far as I can because I think you can see things more clearly through exaggeration than through reality. Now, he deliberately sets out to shock, I suggest, but he also insists on turning it into an extreme joke at times. One critic argued that laughing at the grotesque representations of cruelty on stage serves not to trivialize it, but to recognize it and it reject its power over us. Others might say that it's gratuitous and exploitative and empty of any real moral purpose, ultimately. What do you think? I have a complex answer to that, I suppose. Uh, so, first of all, it's within the terms of uh, in-your-face theatre. Alex Sears defined that term in the 1990s, where writers felt they had to turn to extremes in order to make a point. That's the first thing. Secondly, with McDonough, it's very much genre specific. So if his work is a combination of dark comedy, grand guignol, farce and melodrama, those are all hallmarked by excesses. And I think excess does give you access to certain types of feelings and sensations. Mm -hmm. There's a really great book on neuroscience by a guy called V.S. Ramachandran, and he talks about the importance of realities that are distorted effectively. And he said, you know, if you look at the images in Picasso, they're more effective because they're distorted than if they were realistic. And I think with McDonough's writing as well, it's the distortion of their connections to reality that makes them, I suppose, more viable, more interesting, more resonant than the, the horrors that we see in them. And in many respects, the horrors that we see in them are purposefully unreal. So they're grotesque, they're bizarre, they're over the top. They're never done authentically. So in The Lieutenant Diminished Moore, for instance, there's a scene where characters are wading around in blood on the stage after you know dismembering three people. Yeah. But you see the mechanics of the dismembered bodies purposefully. The blood on the stage is sticky. It's done playfully, it's done subversively, and it's not done realistically. If it was recreated as if you're doing a, a film that's, you know, dominated by realism and the imperatives of realism, that becomes altogether different. So the reenactments are not realistic. And if you look at Seven Psychopaths, all the flashback stories are all done in this kind of garish, colourful way. They're not done realistically. It's gore, expanded, uh, amplified. And I think it's more influential as a consequence. And in particular, you can connect up the cartoon aspect to it but also with the idea of the abject, you know, that, that thing that makes us uneasy. And sometimes it is horrific moments. There's a play called The Behanding in Spokane, where a guy has a case full of hands that have been chopped off that he's collected going around America. 
And it's the gory aspect that's more important than anything else. Or in the Skull and Connemara, they're on stage drunk and they're melting skulls. They're not real skulls, obviously, but fragments will fly into an audience as a way of a transgressive gesture more than anything else. So it's getting the taboo and exploiting it or exposing it. So I'm fascinated as to what's going on, as you just described, in neuroscientific terms, in terms of how we react to this excess. Because you mentioned Lieutenant Aminish Moore, and that is a very graphic scene. It's very hard to watch, even though you know this is not real. I'm in a theater. It's pretty explicit. And likewise, as you said earlier, these stories that we're told and we witness in mime and you know what happens to Katurian and to Michael, these are hard to digest. What is it that makes this, and is it right that they make this easier to digest? What is the point of making it easier if that's what he's doing? I think it's easier to digest it because it's easier then to countenance the reality of violence that exists in the world that we live in. When you hear the voice sometimes of survivors and their trauma, you know it's true and it's very unnerving, but you don't want to see that violence enacted for you to prove the horror of it in some ways. Well, you may not want to, and you may not choose to go to the theater to have that experience, but would it not be as effective to witness? I am not sure I understand how leavening it in some way or making it unreal makes it more impactful. Because it's more palatable, my guess. You don't have to deal with the the realistic resonances of it. But why shouldn't we be forced to deal with the reality of the violence rather than it being comic book? And I think one of his points might be that at that level, that he's demonstrating how easily we ultimately accept these images and what goes on. In fact, there's also, of course, some suggestion of a fascination for it that Mm. he must be playing on, that we go to Mm. horror films or films that uh, involve graphic violence somehow in, I don't know, is it a cathartic way or, and is laughing at it some way that we can fend off the horror reality, but he's making us more aware of the fact that we are tolerating this and kidding ourselves in some fashion. Well, I think you could argue that very clearly. We are kidding ourselves, but maybe we have to kid ourselves about the horrors that exist around us, you know, and what is tolerable and what is intolerable and how we make things tolerable for ourselves. And maybe it is by disguising that violence. You know, I would say two things on that. If you look at Seven Psychopaths, Marty, the writer, no longer wants to write the Hollywood movie that's fixated on violence and horrors, but the screenplay itself ends up exactly being that anyway, if you know what I mean. So it's both playful, but it also fulfills that obligation. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, you know, uh, Zizek has a very interesting distinction between different types of violence. And one violence is the subjective violence that we experience in the everyday, which is the violence in the streets or, you know, a tourist getting beaten up in Dublin or whatever. But then he talks about the objective violence, which is the darker violence. It's the horror that actually makes societies operate in some respects and the oppression that's associated with that violence. And that is a darker violence that is very clearly in McDonough's writing. And I don't know if it's what you're saying, that it's pointing out the fact that our only way of coping with that is by presenting it in in that, you know, sheltered way. But, you know, for most of us, we have to get on and get on with our every day. And if we were to really dwell on that aspect of it in our everyday lives, that would make it quite difficult for us. One of the things that it does, of course, is that like we are having this conversation today, it makes us think about violence. Yeah. Right. So I came away from seeing the show recently and rereading it. And I am full of questions about our propensity for violence and how we respond to it. Mm. Because, you know, we are attracted to it in some way. We seem to want to read crime fiction or watch violent dramas on TV or in film. And I'm fascinated as to what compels the men in power, like the policemen, to brutalize other human beings or other people to abuse children or to murder people. Well, you know, McDonough has that fixation then with the psychopath and what that means in the writing more broadly. There's an awful lot of characters that have psychopathic behaviours, that have no empathy, that have no ability to feel or think for anybody else. 
But it's also in Steven Pinker's work, he talks about different types of violence, which is kind of predatory violence, violence of dominance, revenge, but also the violence of sadism. And there's a lot of sadistic violence in McDonald's characters. But he also talks about ideological violence. And the idea ideological violence is, from Pinker's point of view, the big driver of mass murder, et cetera, et cetera. So I think McDonough is, is very clearly aware of that, the ideological aspect of violence. You get that very strongly in the totalitarian state. But as I said, I think you have to think that the subtext to that totalitarian state is the violence more broadly in democracies or in first world democracies. And we can't get away from that either. One of the small points that's troubled me is you talked about McDonough's fixation. There seems to me there may be a fixation on dismemberment, yeah, which runs through many of the works. And what is it about that that he uses and that we respond to? Is there something that makes that so uncomfortable? I think, you know, dismemberment, the chopping off of hands, the burning of hands in the Lonesome West, the plunging of the mother's hands into Hot Isle in the Beauty Queen of Lanham. You have the chopping off of the fingers in the more recent film. Yeah, it's a frequent trope. And what does it mean? I think it's a shortcut in some respects to what makes us feel viscerally incomplete. The horrors of violence associated with that. And you can read it from a kind of psychological point of view, but you can also read it as what makes us feel a little bit of disgust or unease. I was talking to somebody who watched a recent film and she said, once the fingers went, she she left. She couldn't cope with that. And this was somebody who works in the medical profession. <laughs> you know, what are you mixing up, basically? Or people can go and see a stuffed cat getting squashed on stage, but it's only a prop. It's not real. And yet people have that visceral response to the cat. So it's really about what you bring to the project as much as anything else. And he knows these are triggers for people, I'm just assuming, yeah. Well, I think you've rather proved your point about the artificiality of it and the excess of it, that somehow that's more effective because, as you say, the medical person responded to the fake dismemberments. Yeah. And then in this play, we should acknowledge that in The Pillow Man, there are these moments because one of the stories involves a little boy having his toes cut off and the policeman at one point open a box and show these dismembered toes. So it's, yes, it's a running theme. And I think one of the most important things is this creation of this sense of unease that you just talked about. And I'd like to come to that in a second. First, you mentioned the psychopath and the lack of empathy. So I want to ask you this. One of the results of the tone of the play is perhaps that there is a distance between us and the characters in the play and the conventional emotional alignment or empathy that one might have with characters in drama. Mm. We're always aware of McDonough's self-conscious manipulation of his art, of the genre, the tongue-in-cheek voice, the ironic voice. And as we said already, the violence and the imagery are so extreme that they're unreal. And the result does not that inevitably distance us from being emotionally involved with the characters? And does that matter? Yeah, so I, I don't think you go to a Martin McDonough play the way you would go to a Brian Friel play or a Marina Carr play or a Conor McPherson play. You know, you're almost required to be empathetic to the characters and their journeys. With McDonough, I think McDonough's great skill is to not allow his characters to express empathy very often. And in, in some ways... The deprivation of empathy creates a different type of audience effect. It's not quite acting in quotation marks, as Brecht would describe it as, but the, the empathy depletion, I think, is essential to the dramaturgy that he creates. And then when he allows moments of empathy, it's all the more effective in many ways. Well, OK, but those moments are so few and far between Amen. that I find that that can be a challenge. Yeah. I mean, it may be that, um, you know, I'm susceptible to this conventional relationship with the art that allows my empathy to be exercised and catharsis in some way, maybe perhaps to operate as well. And we're not afforded very often, if at all, that kind of usual engagement, which he would argue, and I think, again, this could be back to the fundamental point, is comforting to us ultimately, which he doesn't want to comfort us. But there are moments where, as you say, there were only possibly in the recent production two moments where I felt that, or in reading the play, where I felt that those moments stand out. One was Topolsky late on 
we discover that his son has drowned. And it's just the most fleeting reference in passing. And in the production in London, Steve Pemberton, who plays the role, has this wonderful moment where you see the real emotional impact on that character of that event in his past, in his life. And for once, that felt real. All the rest of his behavior was a performance and a complicated one in that sense. But for one small moment, you had that moment of human understanding. And it might also have been when Katurian actually kills his brother, Michael, with a pillow, inevitably. And he says, it's not your fault, Michael. Yeah. It's not your fault, crying. I thought that was a moment of human forgiveness because of Michael's reduced capacity or diminished responsibility, given how horrific and how critical he's been of the horrors of the crimes he's committed. That was an illustration of your point about these moments, infrequent as they may be, of possible empathy. Can we talk about the ending of the play, Eamon? I think you trailed this a little bit at the beginning, because one of the things that goes on, particularly in the latter part of The Pillow Man, is that Katurian is focused on ensuring that his stories will live on after he dies. And as we are saying earlier, the play is partly about the power of storytelling. So do we assume that by ending the play with his stories being saved, that Madonna is somehow championing the importance of creative literature? Or again, is that just too simple-minded? The first time I ever wrote about this play, I wrote about it in terms of legacy between this and Death of a Salesman. And my, my sense was, what do you want to leave behind? And his legacy is his writing, and he invests so much in that. So his fantasy from beyond the grave is that his legacy survives. And if you look very closely at the film script for In Bruges, Ken, when he's in the hotel room, in fact, is reading a copy of The Death of Capone by K.K. Kachurian. <laughs> so the suggestion is that the writing does survive. But it runs counter, he says, to Katurian's normally downbeat type of ending. I think that's the first thing. And the second thing, the ending, I think, is really important. The stories survive. Ariel does something compassionate and generous. And secondly, the story is about, spoiler alert, so Michael is visited by the Pillar Man. And as he is visited by the Pillar Man, he is given a choice to end his life early or to basically suffer so that his brother would become a writer. And this is Keturian's fantasy, and it's a fantasy of brotherly love. It's a fantasy of somebody not choosing a way out, but choosing suffering for the benefit of others. And therefore, the ending is about solidarity, connection, community, and it's also in praise of, I suppose, somebody taking on a burden. So it gives meaning and purpose to pain, which in fact is often erased in people's reflections on McDonough's work. So what triumphs in that sense? And the triumph is that you are willing to take on a burden on behalf of somebody else, which is a fundamental expression of solidarity. And I think the consequence there is is a really important one. Okay, I credit that. However, may I suggest it might be more ambiguous even as well, because it must raise the question of whether Michael's suffering is worth the stories that Katurian writes. I mean, surely that has to call into question the relative importance of the art and life. And frankly, why would you choose the suffering that Michael endures? And in fact, they even raise the question for these horrific stories, should they be preserved? It's ironic, as you say, and I also understand the principle and the point that Ariel, who to date would appear to be the baddie in simple terms, actually has this redemptive act of some kind where he saves the stories. And he, for one, has been one of the fiercest critics of the stories and their horror and how they shouldn't be allowed to exist. I know that we've already said that McDonough would be against censorship, but I think it's not as straightforward as you just described in terms of the morality of Michael's decision. Well, it is Katurian's fantasy. That's the first thing I said. Right, of course. It's his version of what it should be. But either way, it's his inclination to signal that above something else. And it's also 
his expectation that somebody, go back to your point, that somebody else taking on the pain that affords him his creativity, which might be an indulgence of sort. Yes. But you go back to how Keturian has looked after his brother and he has looked after his brother, you know, very nobly. And he's been very kind and supportive to his brother through his life. And not only that, he rescued him from a horrific situation. So you have to tie that into uh, the understanding of that as well. But it is a fantasy. I'm not saying that's the reality of that. But I think it does question the issue of pain. And if you look at you know, what's the purpose ultimately of the writing, you know, some people would say, well, it's postmodern. You can't differentiate between pain and pleasure. It's simply it is what it is. But I think McDonough does try to differentiate in some ways in the writing between right and wrong, good and evil. But it's not just simply black and white. It's very complex because in the Pillaman, there are alternative rival views of morality or of justice. So it's the child side that Ariel talks about. And that's his take on the world. The state itself has its own overarching ideological view, which is the state knows best. And also you have the, I suppose, the values of fairy tales as well, which is slightly different to Ariel's take, which is that those who do bad get their comeuppance of sorts. And of course, in this, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Whereas if you look at most fiction, you know, there's a, a certainty to the comeuppance aspect of it. McDonough doesn't afford that to you in this. So it, it might apply, it might not. And it's that sense of uncertainty that makes it interesting. The play is full of moral ambiguities. Caturian, as you mentioned, kills his parents to end his brother's torture. Does that seem a sensible trade-off? And Caturian kills his own brother, again, to save him from further torture? Or is it because he wants to save his own stories and he can then use that as a bargaining chip? Michael, the horrific crimes he commits, can he be held accountable for his actions given his diminished capacity? And as we said, that Michael is submitted to torture, I mean, that is Caturian's imagining, so that he could write stories. I mean, that's morally ambiguous, certainly. When the last lines of the play, you mentioned about the downbeat ending, that he says he's avoiding because the stories are saved, and that that ending is somehow more in keeping with the spirit of the thing, spirit of the thing being this play. How is it more in keeping? What is the spirit of this thing? Well, he says that, first of all, it's a loop of prayer. In other words, it's basically the consolation of, of optimism that I think we need in some respects. I had a student some years ago who did a, an MA thesis on this play in terms of a utopian performative that actually was very, very optimistic. Wow. And equally, I think I would have had a student who did a thesis on this play in the very opposite, who would have seen it as a dystopian performative. So it's open to all those types of readings and interpretations. And I think that's what makes the work rich and complex rather than actually settling for one point of view or perspective. I think ambiguity is important, but ambiguity doesn't suggest no value system. If something is frail and fragile, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I think if you look at McDonough's work more broadly, there is this fundamental sense that justice is precarious, justice is frail, but it doesn't mean that you cannot go after justice because as Michael Sandel says, justice is fundamentally judgmental. So in a way, despite all the ambiguity, there are, in a sense, judgments that we all make in relation to the play. And I think that's what makes it quite interesting. That's fascinating as to whether justice is served throughout. You do have, I guess, you have some sense that McDonough understands, and it goes back to the separation of art and life, what is right and what is wrong. I don't think we ever lose sight of that, even though in all sorts of ways, you use the term postmodern, it's very unsettling in form, and it seems to eschew any universal truth or some single reliable defining morality. In fact, I've read somewhere that postmodernism, the line was indeterminacy is a fundamental characteristic of postmodernism. I thought that was very neatly put and felt a bit appropriate. He's not spoon feeding us a consoling moral order. And maybe that's what upsets so many people in watching his work is that it ultimately leaves you unsettled. It was a very good article in the New York Times during 2005 and six, where Billy Crudup, who played Katurian, talk about the whiplash effect 
that a play went from emotion to emotion and you just could not settle or with one experience. And Charles McGrath wrote an article about it, said if you were to trace the audience response like a sociologist, it went from one emotion to the next all the time. So there was no sense of, like if I, I have a Greek play of a catharsis or going towards a moment of catharsis. There's nothing like that. You've been shoved all over the place. And I think that's a, an important way to understand McDonough's writing. And I think the indeterminacy is important you know, people talk about no access to kind of grand narratives or no overarching value system with postmodernism. And yet at the same time, when you read McDonough's comments, and especially more recently, he talks about moral outrage and the importance of that to his writing. And there's a way of reading the Pillaman to say that that's, you know, the moral outrage is very clearly there in how people are treated by the justice system, for instance. I would say McDonough's greatest focus as a writer is on miscarriages of justice across the board, from the beauty queen up to a play like this. He's all the time calling miscarriages of justice out. When he wrote about uh, the Lieutenant in Moore, he spoke about a pacifist rage. And in a sense, those two words don't go together. And yet that's what the writing is about. It's a very much a uh, play that's full of violence, that's anti-violent. And that's what audiences need to struggle with. So it's easy to write a play that's anti-violent, but to write a play that uses violence to be anti-violence, I think it makes it more difficult for audiences in many respects. Well, I think you're right there. That's where we started, that things don't go together easily here, do they? Yes. The humor and the horror, and that's what unsettles us. But that there is some moral understanding underlying all of that. What is fascinating, as you're saying, is we're going through all this whiplash. Why do we voluntarily subject ourselves to it? Interesting to see that the audience in London for the current revival, they loved it. And yet it's not an easy play. No, it's a very, very difficult play. And if you were to say to somebody, well, it's a play that deals with child torture, you know, why would I go? And my answer is that it's not about child torture, even though it deals with the issue of child torture. I can't remember when this essay was written, but Mark Ravenhill, the playwright, wrote a very interesting thing. And he said that his generation of writers came to maturity with the death of Jamie Bulger all those years ago in Liverpool, where you had the murder of a child by children, which in a sense threw all their values you know, up in the air effectively. So taking a left wing or a right wing position no longer seemed sensible in relation to something like that, which was simply chaotic. And he said, very interesting, that McDonough's work has an awful lot of plays that deal with vulnerable children. And he ties that into that overall movement that you get in his plays, like Shopping and Effing, for instance, as well, where ultimately morality is prompted by the vulnerability of children and what that might mean. Well, difficult stuff. Thank you so much for helping us to better understand McDonough's world and particularly The Pillow Man. Before we bring the curtain down, Eamon, one of the features of the podcast is I like to ask my guests to recommend another play that we might cover on the podcast or one that's just a personal favorite. So I know this will be a difficult choice for you, but could you single out something that you could recommend to our listeners? Well, I know you covered Conor McPherson's Girl from the North Country, but The Weir, I think, is one of my favorites. Yes. Uh, Marina Carr's play by The Bog of Cats is a kind of Irish classic. I know the old vicar doing Pygmalion very shortly, and I think that's a terrific play. Uh, well, I would definitely like to do the Weir and Pygmalion. I don't know Marina, so I'll go and look that one up. Thank you very much. Yeah, not at all. Before we bring the curtain down, just to say The Pillow Man is running at the Duke of York's Theatre in London's West End until the 2nd of September. So if you want, what did you describe? Some moral outrage, but also some... Some fun. <laughs> a good night out. Some fun. <laughs> a good night out. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Eamon, so much for taking the time. It was, a, it was a great pleasure to talk to you and to meet you. Thank you, Douglas. As the curtain falls on Katurian's final story, perhaps the point finally is that the different tones and perspectives that we have witnessed, the comedy and the violence, the fragmented form, the surreal stories, the moral ambiguity, even nihilism, are by definition irreconcilable, designed to unsettle us. The point is to ask us to scrutinize as closely as we've been trying to do, why are we responding in this way? As Katurian says, the idea is you should wonder what the solution is, but the truth is there is no solution. 
The point is to ask ourselves the questions and to recognize that it is the difficulty in answering them that the story is about. Thanks for listening. See you next time. There are additional footnotes about this and every other play that we cover in the podcast available to our patrons. Patrons also enjoy exclusive access to the play review, bonus episodes in which I review current productions that I see in my regular theatre going. To become a patron, visit patreon.com backslash the play podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at the play pod and on Instagram at the play podcast. Thank you again for listening and for your support. See you next time. Thank you.